Thank you, uh, Lincoln, and uh, also for the opportunity to uh, present uh, the work that we've been doing over the well past years, many years. I should always say we started this endeavor uh, 10 years ago with a big vision, uh, and big ideas and big plans. And, and, and well, I'm very, always very proud being able to present our work and what we've established in those years. Um, because it's, uh, uh, well, indeed it's an, a unique resource, but I think it's also impressive to see that with these new technologies, we can make differences eventually for patients. And so my presentation will not only be focused on genomics and what technology does, but also on the, the, the consequences for the patients and the trials that we were able to set up. Let me first uh, introduce uh, the Hartwig Medical Foundation. Actually, also, if you have any questions in between, please ask. Uh, uh, it's not really important for me to come to the end of my presentation. It's more important that you get the information you came for. So the Hartwig Medical Foundation, it's a not-for-profit organization actually founded in 2015, uh, completely independent. Uh, we set up a laboratory uh, independently in, in, in Amsterdam, anti-building, no people, no machines, uh, uh, four and a half years ago. Uh, we're currently about 18 uh, persons, uh, most of them in Amsterdam, but we also have some people in uh, Australia, three persons working on software development and also actually two sitting here in Toronto uh, working on automation of uh, pipelines um, in, uh, in the cloud-based environment, reducing turnaround times of what we're doing and also reducing costs. And that's a very significant part of the endeavor as well. Um, on top of that, we do uh, we try to add something to the system. We are not there to compete with hospitals or with pathology departments. We're trying to add something to the system that is not available and can make a difference to the patients. Um, and we do that actually by this whole genome sequencing. And we've done it in such a way that we can do all these procedures in an ISO accredited uh, way so the data and information can also be used for clinical decision making. So why are we all doing all of this? Well, you know all the promise of precision medicine, personalized cancer care. Uh, you would argue if you read the, the biology books, uh, you know how, what you should do when you treat ca uh, cancer patients, but what we do in practice is quite often what we call standard of care. We start with the treatment that works best on average for all the patients in a certain group. And knowing biology, knowing how cancer genomes, uh, how cancer cells work and are deranged and using those uh, characteristics that has been basically driven the, the development of targeted medication and uh, also the promise that eventually uh, we, we should be able to stratify uh, drugs towards patients rather than just trying the first one, then the second one, then the third one. Mm -hmm. If we want to be able to do that, we need comprehensive diagnostics, so we need to understand the cancer cells, and we need to have sufficient informative biomarkers. And I think in both areas, we still have to improve quite a bit. We believe whole genome sequencing is part of that story or that solution. I'm not going to claim that it's the solution because that would be, uh, I think, over-promising uh, something and we should not do that. Uh, but hopefully it does contribute to small improvements and small steps forward and better uh, survival eventually for patients. So, Hartwig Medical Foundation actually does only one thing, and that is whole genome sequencing of cancer samples. With the data resulting from that, all genome sequencing here in the middle, we do two things. We basically extract the relevant information that we can find in the whole genome sequencing data that is actionable according to today's standard and knowledge. We extract that from this enormous amount of data and report that just and, 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 and summarize that in a six page PDF report. It's not more than that that is relevant for the clinic and the doctors. That goes back uh, to the hospital and can be used for uh, 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 decision, uh, it's a decision support information for the hospital. The other part is we bring this information also together in a structured database and also collect clinical information from the hospitals to enrich this database. And that is the knowledge base that should help drive research for improvement of the left branch of this graph, the patient reports of the future. Um, we believe that these two activities are sort of the same and belong to each other in a, uh, a learning healthcare system, what we need to make healthcare uh, sustainable in oncology and at the end of the day, making sure that the right drugs end up with the right patients. Good. What I'm going to do, um, I'm going to try to, to cover these three aspects. So I'll start with the whole genome sequencing, talk about database activities and talk about the patient reporting activities, the activities towards the clinic. 
And uh, to understand how the database was shaped, it's good to look at uh, a little bit back on why we started all these studies. And that was really in a, in a study setup where we looked at the unmet need of uh, actually over treatment. We are, a lot of treatments that we give currently to patients uh, only work for 20, 30, maybe 35% of patients. So can we reduce that? So we set up a study, uh, CPT-02, which was a prospective data collection study for biomarker discovery. So before a patient went on a, on a standard of care treatment, preferably a targeted treatment with an unmet need with a lot of over-treatment, um, and a biopsy was taken and we did whole genome sequencing of that. We focused on metastatic cancer for two reasons. Patients die of metastatic cancer. And the other reason is all these new drugs and all these expensive targeted drugs they are typically given to patients with metastatic disease. And this is where the biomarker discovery is so urgent. So what we did, collect pre-treatment YFC from these uh, patients, blood sample uh, as a control for germline control, and we integrate all genome sequencing data with clinical data. We saw that off in the context of the Center for Parasite Cancer Treatment, which already started with this concept in 2010. Uh, Hardwick Medical Foundation uh, kicked in in around 2015, and from that point we switched from panel-based sequencing right away to whole genome sequencing as an analysis approach. And over time, we scaled the approach from three hospitals so originally in this, in this uh, founding fathers of this uh, center. Uh, we scaled to 49 hospitals in the Netherlands, and there are about 80 hospitals in the Netherlands, 17 million people in the Netherlands. Uh, that's the size that we're servicing. So most cancer patients are seen in the hospitals. Uh, that are united in this uh, uh, collaboration. It's not a view of what we're doing from a sample perspective. We collect a tube of blood and a, a biopsy, metastatic lesion. We collect fresh frozen material. So we established protocols for collecting fresh frozen material in all these 49 hospitals. So many at the beginning said, oh, we cannot do that. We do only do FFP. We said, well, you cannot do that. What do you need? So we helped them out solving their problem. And now 49 hospitals can provide us with fresh frozen samples. We believe that is essential. Whole genome sequencing only has a value if you can build up this database and use it as a learning care system platform. And there you need high, as high quality data as possible. And you only get that from fresh frozen material. Um, the blood, we do collect actually the plasma for circular tumor DNA uh, analysis. We don't do anything with that at the moment. We're just collecting it because everyone is, wants to look at it. So we just cre create a biobank of that. Uh, cells are used, we use the DNA from the, from the pellet of the blood as a control. Tumor cell, we first check if there's enough tumor cell purity in there. We initially did that by the pathology. We now do that molecularly by doing a, a low-pass sequencing, which is much more accurate. Um, we also isolate RNA from the biopsies. Uh, we do this on the side, the sequencing. So the RNA sequencing I'll not talk about further anymore. Uh, that we see sort of still as a research activity. <clears throat> and uh, we actually sequenced the tumor to about 110x, uh, well, between 100 and 110x, and the uh, blood between 35 and 40x on average. This data is used as input for the somatic variant calling, and uh, we also do germline variant calling. This is what simply, in a very simple scheme, what our pipeline looks like. We uh, started off using open source software that is available and commonly used. We use consensus calling and all kinds of approaches, but we, uh, by looking more and more and more at our data, we, we felt that we, that we could get the highest quality by improving some of the existing tools with post-filtering steps, and other tools were just not, well, not suitable enough, not good enough to our perspective, and we developed a few new tools in this setup. Uh, and some of these tools that are listed here are components adding on top of normal, normal variant callers to add functionality for example, being able to identify low, um, um, low frequency variants at hotspot locations, uh, for example. That's a tool that's specifically developed uh, to in increase the diagnostic yield at uh, relevant positions. Um, this is simply what it looks like. Uh, uh, the tools that we develop, all of them are open source. So in principle, you can implement this whole pipeline anywhere else. Of course, it needs a bit of work, but because of your specific environments, and we're working uh, very hard, uh, well, with the people here in Toronto, to make all of this available in a cloud-based environment. Uh, so then it should, in principle, at the end, be just providing a, your uh, fast Q files uh, or BAM files, whatever you want, and the whole tool should uh, run. We did extensive validations on the performance of all of this stuff. Um, 
there's a lot of information in, in the paper that we, that we just published a few 50 minutes ago. Um, this is just one comparison because I know a lot of people here are working with Peacock data. Uh, one of these validations that is in there is to, to see how well our pipeline compares to what Peacock calls. And basically what we did here, I think this is uh, 25 samples or something that we did run that are from the Peacock project from the ICGC project, breast cancer cohort. We did run them through our pipeline and looked for the correlation of the variants. And you see that with all the variant types, there is a very strong correlation. Every spot here is a patient. So that looks good, but if you look very closely, you see differences. Uh, there is a linear correlation, but the numbers are not the same. That is logical because pipelines are different, and especially for the indels, there is a big difference, and the choices that are made for indel calling in the Peacock pipeline is quite stringent, while we allow for much more calls, but almost all of them are in repeat regions where the Peacock pipeline made other choices. So be aware of that, but it's important to do these benchmarks to know where the differences come from. And they, got, they are there for a reason. An important, important, another important difference is the sequencing depth between these two cohorts. On average, the, um, the PICO cohort is on average 52x depth for the tumor, and we are about twice that depth. The simplest thing that we could do is take our data and downsample it to 52x and see how much we start losing. We did that here for 10 samples, and on average, you, you start losing 10% of the SNVs if you go from 106x to 52x, 20% of the structural variance. 20% uh, of the MNVs, and actually for the indels, you don't lose anything. Uh, and that has to do with some weird stuff in the pipeline. I will not, will not go into detail there. Um, another thing that we spend a lot of time and work on that is not part of this landscape paper yet. This is stuff that we did after we have published, and, uh, or actually after we wrote the first version of that paper, is to improve on the structural variant caller, for calling. Because structural variants, are characteristics in cancer genomes uh, that it makes it actually worthwhile doing whole genome sequencing, that you can retrieve all the complexity of the genomes, which is mostly reflected at the level of structural variation. You have very large amounts of translocations, insertions, deletions, but also very complex translocation events uh, and aneuploidies happening in cancer genomes. You want to have a good view of that as well. The tool set uh, is consisting of three tools, uh, GRIDS, which is actually originally optimized and published for germline structural variant caller. It's now optimized as GRIDS version 2 for somatic variant calling. Um, it performs similarly as Manta, and it comes best out of all kinds of benchmarking studies that we did. And it has some additional features that are very useful for us for the downstream uh, part. Uh, and some of those things is that it can also call single end breaks for example. So if you can only map one arm and the other one doesn't go to a unique position to a repeat. Most callers throw it away because they cannot interpret it. GRIDS takes all of them based on the first arm that can be mapped and takes all the other stuff together as unmapped. There's a mini assembly and then suddenly you may start getting phased variants in that uh, piece of sequence which can go up to 500 base pairs and then you can map uniquely and in that way you can call much more break junctions specifically in the, in the genome. That's just one of these features why a structural variant caller can make a difference uh, in a comprehensive analysis of SVs in the genome. PURPLE is a tool that we developed ourselves. Uh, stands for a purity and uh, ploidy estimator. Uh, it basically determines how much tumor cells we have in the genome. If we don't know that, you cannot determine the local ploidy. Uh, and we determine basically the local ploidy of every position in the genome and every variant that we do find. And LINKS is a tool that well, actually, we, we made these two things talk to each other as well, because you can say if you have a copy number alteration, purple calls, there should always be two break junctions called by grids, because every uh, copy number change should have a begin and an end, and that's the break junction. And sometimes they are not there, but if they're there, you know for sure where it is. You can go to nucleotide resolution of the break junction. If it's missing, the tool goes back to grids and asks, did you maybe see something which is below your threshold? and it can basically retrieve that one and do more uh, uh, complete calling of the whole event and more accurate of the break junctions. Links uh, ingests all of that stuff and does interpretation of it and tries to make, for example, fusion genes extraction from it, uh, derives the, there's the chaining of the events uh, to come to a derived chromosome that in principle should have a centimere and two telomeres or some other structure that is stable. Um, so this is a tool set that, that together works. So you can find much more information, GitHub, paper is there, uh, 
don't forget to read the 100 and something pages of supplementary uh, uh, data. Um, this is some examples of sort of automatic outputs that come from this tool set if you apply it to your uh, data. Uh, it can automatically chain together. This is just all the stuff that the computer things belong together. And we recognize this as a chromatopsis event. Uh, what Lynx does, these graphs, uh, they are nonlinear visualizations of the events there. So we can, in that way, map both small and large events in one single plot. That's always a challenge with SVs. So you can have very small insertions of 50 base pairs at the place where also 5 KB or 100 MB of, of sequence is rearranged. These graphs do allow you to visualize all of that in a comprehensive and understandable way. You cannot read the numbers, but you can see from the numbers what the sizes of the fragments are. This is a double minute. Um, that you can see with heavy amplifications. This is the amplification copy number. Here you see basically a, a, a viral line element, basically, sorry, it's a line element from this locus jumping to multiple locations throughout the genome. So you can find these things automatically as well. Pseudogenes, where you only see the axons of a gene inserted. And you also have these complex events happening that seems to be chained, connected to each other, maybe happening in, in subsequent cell divisions. Uh, but they make up one derived complex chromosome. And the interesting part here is that sometimes you have to follow multiple jumps in this graph to get to the eventual fusion gene that is annotated. So some of these examples are typically a simple translocation and a fusion looks like this. In this case, there is a small deletion at the break junction and it basically fuses this gene to that gene. There's also automatic annotation coming from these tools, the fusion genes. And in this case, actually, you also get a fusion gene, but if you start following the lines, you have to make multiple jumps to get to the fusion gene. If you would have only had focused on the break junction, you would not have found this break junction. And for diagnostically relevant genes, uh, for fusions like TMPRS uh, ERG1, you get a 10% increase of sensitivity for detecting thanks to this chaining algorithm. So it does make sense from a clinical perspective as well. So how, how well are we now doing? Because typically people do RNA sequencing to get to fusion genes. Um, we have for 500, a bit more than 500 patients, we had uh, at that point on a sequencing data. Um, we just, it's not very deeply sequenced, but we used our fusion to detect fusion genes. And basically of the 1800 that were detected automatically by the algorithm, 80% were also detected at the DNA level and predicted by our algorithms. So I think that's a relatively good score for a DNA only method for fusion genes. You could also ask the question clinically, is this good enough? Well, that's basically this upper part here in this bar. You find something like 45 fusions that are considered actionable, cosmic annotated fusion genes. For those all except one are detected at the DNA level already. So that says RNA sequencing is not adding too much to this. Actually, RNA sequencing only missed this part here. Of course, that could be still passenger type of stuff, although the cosmic annotation does not suggest that, uh, but they are missed by this depth of sequencing, RNA sequencing that we did. So DNA-based analysis is additive here to the RNA sequencing information. You could also turn around, let's say, what, what else do you call, and this is promiscuous uh, uh, cosmic genes that are involved in fusions. Many of those could be passengers, and there you start seeing that uh, this part, is, this is DNA only, so many of those are not confirmed by RNA. And that could indeed indicate that these are passengers and not expressed. Um, so you do sort of overcall, uh, but they do not end up in your reports because that's only this upper part that, uh, that end up in the, in the clinic. Okay, so in summary, we have optimized a somatic variant calling pipeline, detecting all types of variants that are relevant, uh, and it actually deals with all the complexities that are present in a uh, cancer genome. Uh, and as I mentioned already, uh, while we were building all these tools, it became more and more and more because we wanted to detect and see more and more and more. We went to a pipeline that took five to seven days to run. And we did that in a uh, private uh, compute uh, cluster environment. And there, I think the cost went up to something like 400 euros at some point, just in compute, a storage cost around that. Uh, well, luckily, thanks to some smart guys here, uh, we moved to the Google Cloud, Cloud Platform, can do it in less than 24 hours, and uh, uh, for less than 50 bucks, uh, we can, uh, which is at some, something like uh, 70 uh, Canadian dollars, I think, uh, going from FastQ to Somatic 
variance and actually complete patient reports, as I show in a second. So that's a huge uh, improvement there. Okay, so I'm going to move that to basically the basis of what we're doing. Spend a bit of time on that, but I think it's quite important to, uh, to have that properly aligned so you trust at least what we do as the subsequent step, which is building up a database, doing research, and patient reporting. So I'll talk about the database. Uh, well, this is an old slide, as you can see. It says to be published in Nature and only present on BioArchive. That's now uh, there, and people seeing this may also know that Nature has a new house style uh, as of, uh, uh, I don't know exactly when, but they go to a different uh, layout. Um, there's a lot of details there, so I'm not going to repeat everything in this paper. Maybe some important things. This is pan cancer. We didn't do any selection except for selected by the doctors that participated in this trial for collecting these biopsies and approaching patients. As some of them are studying, I think sarcomas or something, they are, they are overrepresented because of some very active doctors. Um, but in principle, it reflects the incidence, the orange is the, the, the tumor incidence for tumor type in the Netherlands, what I would say in, in a typical Western European country. And the blue one is what we have in the database. Good news and bad news. Good news is we have all tumor types. The bad news, the common tumor types are still overrepresented. And you need numbers in, the, in this type of work that we're doing. So if we would further build out this database, I would say, let's not do it this way anymore. Let's also focus on the lower frequency, varia, lower frequency tumors because there is a huge and mad need on doing better things. Um, Simplest thing that you can start doing is compare these mutational loads. Is there something different? Do, do metastatic lesions have more mutations than primary cancers? Have they evolved further? Uh, of course, we had to correct for these differences in the pipelines, but here we compare to peacock. Uh, and actually, only prostate cancer is the only tumor type where we see more uh, SNVs and indels uh, significantly between the metastases and the primary cancers. For all other ones, it looks like the mutational burdens are sort of similar. The other exception you see is the central nervous system uh, samples, but they, that's a different day, age distribution between the cohorts. Uh, we don't have any pediatric cancers in there, and I think this cohort was exclusively pediatric. Um, this is another observation that we see uh, that the, the metastatic lesions are quite homogeneous, so we don't see a lot of subclonal variants in these tumors on average, because you can see here, we basically, the, the ability to detect subclonal variants depends on the tumor purity very heavily. So this is why we split it up here in bins of tumor purity. So you should, to be really conclusive, focus on the higher tumor purities. But even there, you see that less than 10% of the variants are subclonal, which is much less than what's being observed in, uh, in primary cancers, which tend to be much more uh, heterogeneous in, in also especially in 3D dimensions. This sort of model supports the, uh, sorry, this data supports a model of a single cell escaping one part of a primary tumor by that way going through a clonal step and then expanding without too much selection for subclones. And that is confirmed by the fact that 96% of all the driver genes, which typically drive the existence of subclones, these, these new drivers, actually 96% of all these driver genes are mutations are clonal. So that sort of fits with this hypothesis. Don't generalize my conclusions, because you see there was also tails there with a lot of subclonal variants. So there's definitely a lot of exceptions to this, this uh, rule that I postulated. I think this paper is also interesting to look at, at the structural variant landscape. These are these copy number plots. There is just two here, but they are there for every tumor type. Uh, and they look extremely different. And a lot of things that you can already by I see is, for example, in these glioblastomas, you see loss of uh, uh, chromosome 10 which is actually driven by a gene sitting there. It's P10 as a tumor suppressor. That's probably why this chromosome is lost, to inactivate potentially the second copy of this gene. Similarly, amplification of this chromosome is actually mostly driven by EGFR, uh, quite often in many tumors by uh, the whole chromosome gains. Uh, but you also see that basically the small part here by very focal amplifications of just that specific gene. So you can start seeing a lot of differences between tumor types that are very characteristics. And some observations you can get from there that were previously unnoted uh, as being a characteristics of the tumor type by just making these overviews. Um, 
Another observation related to copy numbers is whole genome duplication. Um, so our tools do extract that information as well from the, uh, uh, from the data. Um, we can uh, determine uh, whole genome duplication uh, events. Uh, there is a, a, a calculation rule for that. You can see the details in the paper. But in 56% of all the tumors, pan cancer that we, see, that we have seen of the metastatic lesions, uh, there is a whole genome duplication that had happened in these tumors. And that is much more than has been rewarded for primary cancers in different reports and different analyses. Um, whole genome duplication is supposed to be an early event in uh, tumor development, so it's not necessarily something that drives metastatic behavior, but it could be a poor prognostic marker um, in general and cancer. And of course, you do see differences in incidence uh, per tumor type, so it might be also tumor type specific. Um, then we can go to drivers per uh, tumor type. Um, this is the, uh, the average number of uh, drivers per sample that we see in a different tumor type. They range between um, uh, four to five to, to almost uh, eight or nine on average per tumor type. Uh, there are tumor types that we hardly know or hardly find any real drivers. The neuroendocrine tumors is, is an example where we hardly ever find also targeted treatment indications. And on the right side of this graph, you basically see the, um, um, the events that mutate by which these driver genes are mutated. And I think from that you can see how important it is to look at all categories. Don't just focus on single nucleotide variants. There is amplifications, duplications, translocations, driving uh, cancer. Um, this is maybe a, a less or maybe a disappointing slide because you could have asked the question, are there actually genes, driver genes that explain metastatic behavior? And the answer is unfortunately no, we cannot find them. There is not a common gene or multiple common genes that drive metastatic behavior of a cancer. The only thing of the drivers in the driver list that we find, yeah, of course, this is all the known list. At the beginning, you see all the known genes like P53, most common APCs, etc. cetera. Uh, the only two things that are unique in this list are the androgen and, uh, sorry, estrogen and androgen receptor. And those are actually not selected for by metastatic behavior, but they are selected for as uh, treatment resistance. And that's been brief previously reported by MSK, but they nicely pop out in this list as well. Be aware that this table has a very long tail, goes up to four or 500 genes. And in that tail, there are very actionable mutations as well, like the N-track fusions. They're really at the end of the tail, 0.5% in the database, but with an actionability, with a drug, with extremely good uh, actionability and good performance in the clinic. So you want to look at the whole picture and not with a panel at the beginning of this curve. Um, the last thing, uh, we also, uh, uh, we sequence tumor normal pairs. So we do, we can uh, see uh, germline predisposition, cancer predisposition uh, variants. This is the table summarizing it. And we did very stringent uh, statistics on identifying these cancer predisposition genes. There is only actually a list of 10 where 80% of all the predisposition variants that are annotated as pathogenic in the community uh, are residing just in, in, in five genes. Uh, you can see the distribution by, by tumor type and which genes these are. In total, in 7.5% of the patients, we do find a cancer predisposition variant, which is fitting very well with observations of others. Um, the interesting thing that we also looked at is how often is actually the second allele inactivated because most of these cancer predisposition genes are genuine tumor suppressors, where the hypothesis is that the second allele is lost somewhere and that's causing the cancer. You see that only in, uh, that is really variable per predisposition gene, how often the second allele is lost. So for certain predisposition genes, it's, it's only 50% of the cases and all of this is almost 100, like the BRCA genes. Uh, the those are really quite often the second allele inactivated by a genetic event. Maybe the others are also inactivated by epigenetic events. We don't know. Um, then uh, mutational signatures. Uh, I'm not a big fan of blindly interpreting signatures, uh, but they could be informative. And I will sort of actually, we didn't have this graph in the original paper. 
basically we had to put it in because reviewers said you need to have signatures in there. I said, well, okay, you can have your signatures. There they are. Um, basically what is shown in this graph, put you with type, the size of the dot is basically the amount of samples affected by that signature. And the darker the dot is, the more mutations per sample are affected by that, um, uh, by that signature. So having a small dot means like a few samples of these, the, the glioblastomas, a few samples really have a very prominent signature 12, um, 11 uh, signature. Um, but in those samples, in those patients, the contribution of the signature is huge. Well, people can probably already guess what that dot is because we have metastatic cancers. They all had previous treatments. So when you're looking at something endogenously, but this is a temozolomide signature. That is one of these dark dots that you see here. There's four dots there, and some of them also relate to, in this specific case, to mismatch repair deficiency. So there's actually in the global stomas a very a relatively high rate of mismatch repair deficiency, uh, which you can also see by, by microsatellite instability, but it also pops up in the mutation signature. This is just one way of interpreting this graph. Um, you see some very uh, prominent things. This is the skin UV, smoke, uh, inhaled uh, carcinogens for lung. Um, so basically all the, all the known stuff is popping up. Not very exciting, uh, except maybe for one thing, uh, which is this signature 17, which is uh, previously described to be present in stomach and um, esophagus cancer. The real reason how that works is unclear. It's a very specific uh, signature, but we also do find it in colon and breast cancer. Why is that? Well, actually in my research lab, we were already work working on the action of what's 5 of you doing. We were throwing that actually on organoids and incubated them for a while with a regime that looks like how a patient is treated. And then looked at the mutation that had accumulated. And a very significant signature popped up, which turned out to be cosmic signatures. 17. So the interesting part now is, well, this paper just actually appeared a few weeks ago as well. Uh, this signature is, can be induced. It's a one signature, but it's induced, can be induced by different processes. One and, uh, endogenous and colon and stomach, so, sorry, in um, esophagus and stomach, and one exogenous by treatment, 5 you. Um, in, well, treated, treated patients. It doesn't really matter what tumor type you take. If they had this 5 of you based type of treatment, which for colorectal cancer is the primary treatment, you start seeing this signature 17. And this is a warning interpreting signatures as mechanisms because there is here two things happening, conver uh, converging on exactly the same signature. Biologically, or, oh, sorry, mechanistically, they actually may converge on the same enzymes and the same process or the same thing that's disturbed. We don't know. We have to dissect that. Good. Um, I think this is also very important for all of you. All of this data has been generated for making research and improving cancer care possible. So all this data is also available for the whole community and not just for the Dutch community where these patients were collected. Um, we have to be aware that data is collected with the consent of the patients for certain purposes. Uh, and we need to be able to check whether your intended use fits with the consent given by the patients. So you have to go through this access controlled mechanism. All the details can be found on our website. Um, and this mechanism, well, maybe the first time it's a bit of work to get through everything, but don't dis we don't want any long project proposals. We want to have it specific and brief. Um, and this works. We've made this data available already for more than 100 um, uh, data requests and researchers internationally, also in the US. Uh, so that we don't have an EU, US data, GDPR type of barriers in this, but we do have paperwork, unfortunately. A pretty easy process and the response time is okay thank you yeah um yeah and, and if, if it doesn't work contact us we want to improve and uh, if you stumble on something or you're not not clear contact us we'll help you out if you're not sure about your proposal don't submit it right away send it to me i'll double check give you advice and and you can then file it uh, i'm not part of the judgment procedure so i, I can do that this and help you out in these processes i'm impartial but i don't do know how how it is being judged and what is important. I've seen 100 by now. Um, this is just some examples of work that's already coming out. It's being on bioarchive. Uh, Lincoln's there as well. Uh, paper is also close to accepted. Uh, um, and I think, the, well, we need the creativity and the, and the big minds of the whole world to make the maximum out of this resource and also combining it with 
information data that you, that you may have from other resources. Um, cancer research is international research. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to, to mention in relation to these mutagenic effects and, and, uh, and the signature type of stuff, because some people still believe this signature 3 is a homologous recombination deficiency signature. Really, people in the clinic have, for some reason, think, oh, I see signature 3, must be homologous recombination deficient. It's really true. And you can see here that it doesn't make any sense because the signature 3 is almost everywhere, right, in every cancer type. So it's not really indicative of HRD. It's, it's not a good thing. So, so we developed one tool I wanted to briefly mention. It's called CORT. It's a random forest pen cancer classifier. It's similar as HRD tech developed in the, uh, by Serena Nix. I know the uh, problem of that is that the software is not available. And the other problem that we figured out once we re-engineered the tool is that it's not suited for pan cancer analyses. It's, it was developed for breast cancer. It's also presented as that. So the tool is good, let that be clear. Uh, but it does not work pan cancer for all kinds of reasons. So we built a new classifier based on a random forest approach, which is different from the HRD tech. Uh, of course, the same type of features do play a role uh, and contribute to this classifier, uh, but we also built a classifier in such a way that it can discriminate BRCA1 and BRCA2 type uh, signatures, which, which come with different features, as you can see from these uh, graphs. Well, that helps us to basically, then you can, we can uh, draw, uh, run that on the complete database and ask the question, how often do we see homologous recombination deficiency? Because that is relevant for prioritizing platinum-based drugs or PARP inhibitor trials. Um, for other tumor types. And um, I think it's interesting to do this, pan cancer. You see ovarian cancer as the most prominent one. This is also where PARP inhibitors are already actually given as standard of care. But you see that, uh, well, breast is a second, but it's second together with uh, pancreatic and prostate cancer and also uh, bladder cancer. Homologous recombination deficiency is actually quite uh, much present between 10 and 15% of the patients. So it's worthwhile looking in those patients for those biomarks and deficiencies as well, because it may open up trials or treatments that you would not have considered before. Um, I'll forget about the underlying genetics, but there is interesting biology there as well to try to find out what are the genes driving this HRD, because it's not all BRCA mutations. You miss half of the HR deficient tumors if you just look at BRCA genes, mutations in those. Okay, and this graph must look familiar. Uh, to everyone here because, well, we, we try to uh, be as open as possible with all the data that we have. Um, and that's a challenge between privacy, sensitivity, and what's public and what can be shared. We believe the ICGC portal is for whole genome sequencing data the best type of way of sharing that and making that available in a browsable way. Uh, uh, that does not mean, mean perfect, I'll, I'll be honest on that as well. We can basically show the single nucleotide variants and the ins small insertions deletions in this platform. The larger events, structural variants, flow these copy numbers, etc. that does all not fit in these platforms. So I think if we want to do this browsable access to the data and the richness of data that whole genome sequencing gives, that we still have a, a large job to do. Uh, but at least this is much better than having nothing. And here you can already, well, people that are just interested in a gene and want to know if it's mutated in a cancer type, they can explore. Uh, so thanks for everyone that contributed to building this beautiful interface and resource. Uh, and it's beautiful to have this running and our data represented in there as well. Um, okay, last part, the medical part. Um, can I use another 15 minutes? Yeah, okay. So all the knowledge that we build up, we brought together uh, in a quality system and in a routine procedures and a quality control, et cetera. Uh, we call that clinical grade whole genome sequencing workflow. And it's a flow from a fresh frozen biopsy tumor blood sample to a patient report uh, with all the steps in between. We have optimized every step and we actually can do this whole procedure now in 14 days on average. Uh, fastest route through this have been nine days without any specific attention. This just happened because of when the sample came in, the weekends, and et cetera. Um, we believe we can uh, push this even further, uh, at least another four days, uh, to make the average turnaround time something like 10 days. And the more samples we do, the faster we can do it, because then we can start machines every day, and now we do it just twice a week. 
This is the end product, clinically speaking. It's a PDF report. You could say, why a PDF report? Uh, technology can do much more than that. Doctors, clinics, electronic health record systems, they want to ingest documents, not web links and stuff and, and computer systems in hospitals typically do not allow for going to other places, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's a PDF-based report that tries to summarize relevant information for the clinic and the patient. We learned from interactions with the hospitals that, and the doctors that we should not make a, try to, to convey as much information as possible because it makes reports unreadable. We listened to the doctors and they said, I want to be able to understand it because the initial report they said, looks nice, but I don't understand anything on it. So we worked a report that has a layered way of complexity and the upper page is sort of a summary page uh, with, um, and that should be readable by any doctor and potentially also by some patients that are informed. Um, these reports, well, it goes it digs deeper than deeper when you go deeper into the report and you end up with the molecular details underlying the observations mm -hmm. and the suggestions on the first page. These reports are 99% automatically generated, except for this piece of text, summary text on the, on the first page. And I think we, can, we at some point should be able to automate 80 to 90% of that process as well. Um, yeah, and this is basically what we offer to hospitals and a lot of first hospitals that you are using this as a service uh, from us, uh, for example, for their clinical trial phase one programs. Uh, uh, so this is already a thing that is offered. Uh, we are not for profit organizations, so the price tag that you see here is what it costs, but that's all. This includes all the personnel, the building, the machines, the chemicals and stuff. So this is what you can do it for. Two thirds of these costs is sequencing chemicals. So goes to Illumina. So if you want this price tag changed, we should, we should limit it to do that. I'm not sure how, but... Uh, um, well, let me... Well, the report, I will not go too, too much into detail. It tries to summarize how many indications we find and how many treatments fit to that. And if you dig in deeper, you can find what are these indications, what are the treatments, where does the evidence come from. This is the part of standard of care. This is approved registered drugs. And this is a tumor type specific clinical trials. So if this was a melanoma, these are all trials for melanomas um, present in the Netherlands. We, we contribute to curating this because this is of course changing continuously, but it's available as a trial in the Netherlands. And on the law, on the further page, we'll see the off-label indications. That's basically links between a molecular alteration and a drug found in whatever tumor type or registered for whatever tumor type. So these drugs are registered um, uh, but it's not proven that they work outside their registered indication of label drug use. Um, this is the molecular details uh, page, and there we try to go a little bit further than just providing the allele frequencies. Uh, we also report basically the copy number of every position and uh, the tumor adjusted allele frequency that we can correct with the tumor purity. And we do some um, interpretation of what we have seen, whether the gene is biologically inactivated or not. Because you can have a hit in the tumor suppressor just by chance, especially in tumors with high mutational loads. You can you start hitting tumor suppressor genes by chance as well. If it's just hitting one allele and the other one is not is fully intact, you don't have a copy number thing or whatever inactivating it, I think we can sort of conclude that the driver likelihood is relatively low and you would not want to base your treatment initially on it unless you don't have another choice potentially. Same holds true for Oncogenes, you look at whether the mutation really has a hotspot location or not, and that can also help in interpreting. So there's rather likely to take this information into account, but also the amount of mutations in that specific given patient and that tumor. So there's a bit more intelligence that you can apply already and bring that to the molecular pathologist because they can and they should at some point understand all of this information. This is all the stuff that's driven by copy number alterations. So you can also inactivate genes by just having a translocation in the gene, so in the intron. So all of that is listed here as well, copy number changes, et cetera. So this report reports on actionable genes with links to drugs and cancer drivers. Um, it's about a, a bit more than 500 genes that are uh, included in this reporting. Okay. And on the last page, we have these uh, advanced uh, tumor characteristics that could become uh, uh, biomarkers at some point. I mentioned already the homologous recombination deficiency actually the tool that was developed based on the database has now already flowed as part of the learning system from the database activities to the reporting stuff. And we want to see much more of that. 
because we should do much better in these reports. Uh, that's already there, and we are setting up trials basically using this parameter uh, with PARP inhibitors and cancer. Uh, my satellite instability status uh, for uh, immunotherapy, uh, it's already used, and there is a lot of discussion uh, on tumor mutational burdens and tumor mutational loads. Uh, difference TMBs is number of mutations per MB, which you can measure by a panel, mutational load, so number of amino acids that are changed by a missense mutation, that you can, you need exome sequencing basically to do that properly. You do this, TMBs, to predict the, the mutational load, as the number of new epitopes for immunotherapy uh, stratification potentially. Trying to correlate these two together, well, we had a discussion with Lincoln on this, but it's, it's, it's not doable. And also the results, if you run a panel and you run whole genome sequencing as the reference standard and see what numbers you get, they're way off. And there is no way on getting that corrected, we also figured out. So we decided not to go into that discussion and say you have to do this, we just provide both measures and figure it out. In our trials, we use only mutational loads to stratify patients for immunotherapy. This is a summary. First two and a half thousand patients, one third of the patients, we don't find anything actionable. And one third, roughly, we find something actionable refers to a clinical trial. Quite often, also not actionable, we have to be honest on that. And what about one third of the cases, again, we see a registered drug to be available and about 50-50 split for on-label and off-label. So there could be really value in this off-label piece, but there, that's the question. And in the last five minutes, then I will focus on whether this is useful to do this, um, to focus on these uh, off-label indications. So that we set up a study, and that was actually driven by the fact that we're doing whole genome sequencing, because we saw these off-label indications all the time. And the only thing a doctor then can do is start calling with the pharma company and ask whether they could provide that drug in the terms of compassionate use type of thing, et cetera, uh, because it's non-reimbursed drug use. Um, so we thought we should do better because this NS1 type of trying this because of based on a report is also not, got, not a good way of doing it because then many people are trying it and they're not learning from it. So we set up a trial to catalog uh, if this drug repurposing, this off-label drug use, whether that is useful or not and, uh, and collect the information and if it doesn't work a few times, we tried it. Don't do it again, but also make it public and, uh, and inform other uh, parties. Um, well, you may have read the paper because this appeared three weeks ago in, uh, in Nature, describing actually the first 200 patients that were treated as part of this protocol. And two thirds of all the patients that went into the study, went into the study because we were doing this whole genome sequencing based patient reporting. Let's skip this slide. This is basically what the trial looks like. We make cohorts based on the tumor type, a molecular profile and a study drug. And I'll show in the next slide what that, how these studies explode. We start with eight patients. If none of them have clinical benefit, we stop. If there is clinical benefit, and we do this, we measure this very simply by initial direct response by resist criteria. Um, if there is uh, more than one patient uh, responding, we expand the cohort with another 16 patients, moving to 24 patients in total. If there is then more than five that have clinical benefit, um, there is a discussion with, with the healthcare authorities in the Netherlands and the pharma company to see if we can expand to a phase three. And for one drug, we successfully did that and agreed with the pharma and the healthcare insurer that if the patient is responding for more than 12 weeks, then the drug will be reimbursed. It's an off-label drug that otherwise would not be reimbursed. So there is a win-win here for everyone. The patient get access to drugs that otherwise not, would not get. Pharma gets an indication reimbursed much quicker than going through these traditional clinical trials and registration routes. And healthcare insurer only pays when the drug works, and the patient for which the drug works. And this is a very revolutionary new way of, of doing this funding. And we hope that more drugs will follow that route that the first one followed. And, uh, and in this way, at some point, it may move, but the evidence that's collected in this study may move towards registration. Um, less than five, and there is response. We can go back to the whole genome sequencing data because every patient also, when they did not enter through a whole genome sequencing, a biopsy will be taken and will be whole genome sequenced. So we can do the learning cycle again from there and see if we can find indications for, with which we can re refine the stratification criteria and then 
so our new cohort, and we can start the cycle again. This is the complexity of the study because cohorts explode quite quickly. If you have one drug, you open a cohort per tumor type. So if you have 10 tumor types where, you, where this drug could be given because where the genetic mutation is potentially present, one mutation, 10 tumor types, one drug, that's 10 cohorts. But if you have two indications, let's say I want to, uh, it doesn't matter if gene A or gene B is mutated, it can already explode to two different cohorts uh, and you go to 40 cohorts uh, at some point. And this explodes quite quickly. So we really try to, to balance between the criteria and what's in a cohort to be specific enough, but also be broad enough to have sufficient patients to be able to close the cohort in a reasonable amount of time to learn from it at some point. Um, more than 1,000 patients have been, well, registered. Uh, 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 almost 500 have started the treatment. Uh, and this is a trial that's running in 37 hospitals in the Netherlands. And uh, this is actually an old one because there is uh, 25 drugs available coming from 10 different pharma companies. This includes all kinds of therapies, targeted immunotherapies, and this portfolio is continuously expanding. The pharma companies see this as a success and a, and a new way of going to registrations. And they start adding more and more drugs and, and there is more and more success and more pharma companies are following. 76 scores opened. Three have been closed. Um, one completed, I'm basically going to this reimbursement phase. Actually, this is a registered indication already in the US, but not in, in, in Europe. But that's one of, well, so let's say called a positive control. It's good that it's registered because it is successful also in our hands. Uh, and a few courts have been closed because there is no benefit. So shouldn't do that anymore. The main message is in this graph. This is the response uh, curves, and basically overall, over all the different cohorts, taking all the patients together, the first 215, 34% have a clinical benefit. And these are patients that did not have any other treatment options, and some are very long and durable responses. So this is not an NS1 cases anymore. This is 60, 70 patients that really benefited already from the whole genome sequencing that we did. Um, and important, it's not just immunotherapies, but it's also small uh, molecule inhibitors and monoclonal antibodies that are uh, uh, pan cancer, looks like only with a multi indication uh, active. So, this, uh, at least in our eyes, is a useful way of looking at uh, diagnostics and treatment. Um, I think with that, I should quit. Uh, and of course, use the pointer. Most important slide. It's always the acknowledgement. Oops, we got the wrong direction. No names on my acknowledgement slides uh, because it's impossible. In these studies, more than a thousand people have contributed in all these different hospitals, uh, working with the patients, uh, handling material, working on logistics, data management, data analysis, etc. So it's impossible to mention everyone and then not forgetting anyone. Of course, very important, all these patients and families that contributed to these uh, studies and uh, the different funding resources uh, that we had. And if you want to know more about us, you can look at our website because there's a lot of details and protocols and things that you can find there as well. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>